moving to the next topic next talk yes. Yes. of dr rafael pillai from italy okay yes here i am hello, hello doctor hello how are you fine fine doctor thank you very much for uh, this invitation uh, i i will let get me, started right yes yeah, before starting your topic a talk i can uh, let me introduce your bio doctor yes you yes yeah thank you Okay, Dr. Pillai from the Dr. Europeus received his master's degree in pharmacy at GD Annunzio University in Kitty Pescara, Italy in 2005, where he also served internships at Cell Physiology Laboratory and Molecular Biology Laboratory. Prior, he was an Erasmus student of the faculty in the pharmacy, the Remis in Venice, France. He received his Dr. Europeus in 2010 from PD Salpeter Institute in Paris, France. And also in 2010, he received his PhD in Biochemistry, Physiology and Pathology of Musical at G. D. Anzo University in Kitty Pascara, Italy. He, has, he was hired as a postdoctoral scholar in the Department of Pharmacology and Physiology at the University of South Florida in Tampa on two research grants funded by the Office of Naval Research and Diverse Alert Network. He has written and lectured widely worldwide. He has been involved in ongoing research at the University of South Florida with the use of ketone esters. Over to you, Rafael Pillay. Perfect. Thank you very much for your, your introduction. Uh, that's a honor to be here. I'm going to try to be um, as synthetic as possible to explain what my uh, research path um, what was my research path actually. So today I'm going to talk about something a little uh, different compared to what I have been discussing so far. Um, I'm going to start with my personal experience for my postdoc. Uh, so I, uh, for my postdoc after my uh, degree in pharmacy and my PhD in physiology, I moved to the United States and I started working with the Office of Naval Research. Uh, what do these guys do? They take care of uh, tactical mission, defense, attack, and uh, submarine rescues. Um, specifically, the agency that mm, took care of uh, my grant uh, was named the ONR, Office of Naval Research, which is the research, research section of the uh, US Navy. So we used to have a what we call the gas palace on the back of our laboratory in, uh, in Tampa, Florida, which was a, a, a place we used to collect tanks for our experiments. And these tanks would mimic uh, some deep uh, uh, Navy SEAL dives uh, in uh, different gases or gas mixes, as you can see from this picture. Um, so uh, the reason why it was, uh, I started my postdoc with these guys was because they wanted to study the phenomenon of uh, uh, central nervous system oxygen toxicity, which is a particular phenomenon that, uh, uh, you know, manifests itself uh, in like, you know, uh, epileptic like seizures. Uh, and this can happen in two ways, in two scenarios. So scenario number one, during a, a deep dive, breathing pure oxygen or uh, in a hyperbaric chamber for, during hyperbaric uh, um, oxygen therapy. So for those who uh, want to have an idea of what that looks like, what a CNS oxygen toxicity look like, uh, I have this video. Uh, this video shows on the left a person breathing in pure oxygen at the depth of about 40 meters, 2.8 atmospheres. Uh, the guy on the right is a physician. He's breathing not uh, pure oxygen, but air, so only 21% oxygen. So um, I'm going to just give you an idea what it looks like when someone is going to have seizures at you know, at depth. The guy on the left is feeling dizzy, so he has to take off his mask. So he's going to take off his mask, but he's still going to have seizures. He's going to lose his consciousness, not going to remember a single thing. However, he's going to be out of danger because, um, you know, he's in a controlled environment. He doesn't risk to drown, so no problem. He's going to have tonic tonic seizures of his uh, four limbs, uh, of, of his, uh, sorry, of his limbs. As you can see here, on his, his legs. Now he's having, right now, uh, um, spasms, like epileptic spasms. This guy is not conscious at the moment and is not going to remember a single thing after this episode. So uh, we were in this lab to understand not only um, 
why this was happening, uh, but also uh, to find a way to prevent this to happen. And uh, when I got there, they used to work on uh, the solitary complex neurons um, on the uh, brain stem. And after that, they wanted uh, to translate, to move that research onto whole anime physiology. This is why we started implanting in the Spragdali rats some uh, radio telemetry modules that were able to monitor in real time the transcephalogram, electromyogram, electrocardiogram, as you can see here also body temperature and physical activity and to transmit this data to the receiver and the whole, you know, the whole lot of um, instruments was placed inside the hyperbaric chamber and the whole thing uh, basically used to dive uh, at uh, four, five or six atmospheres uh, of pressure uh, to mimic the Navy SEAL dives. Uh, so uh, we wanted to collect the data before, during, and after the dive to see if there was any physiological marker able to predict uh, an event of seizures happening. Just to give you an idea what a, a rat seizing looks like, you can see this on the right panel. This rat is going to have seizures, going to sit on his limbs, and it's going to have a tonic clonic movements of four limbs and head. See, this is a rat seizure. Here we go right now. So at this point, we used to stop the experiments. So this is the type of data we used to collect. You have different channels with different uh, data. What did we find? We, uh, we found that three to five minutes before the onset of seizure, there were two parameters, two physiological parameters that would considerably increase, the respiratory frequency and the tidal volume. Now, the tidal volume is the amount of air that a rat would breathe and the respiratory frequency is the amount of times per minute a rat would breathe. So these two parameters would increasingly, would consistently increase. And this would tell us that a seizure was gonna happen. So not only we wanted to understand how this happened, not only we wanted to understand if there was any way to predict, we also wanted to find a way to avoid this to happen, to prevent this to happen. And in order to do so, we started working on antioxidants, but we uh, early found out that this kind of uh, molecules were too mild for the type of uh, activity we wanted to explore. So we went through uh, some anti-epileptic drugs to see if they're, you know, they could be good for us, but there are so many side effects. So we didn't want to take any risk with the Navy SEALs. So we found that there was actually one of the best ways would have been to keep them onto ketosis. Uh, now, as you uh, probably know, um, since the um, since 1920, uh, the John Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore was able to uh, demonstrate that a ketogenic diet, which is a diet without any carbohydrates and a high fat, is able to uh, keep patients without any seizures. You know, epileptic patients without any seizures. There is a as some sort of a, a central nervous system control that helps preventing seizures to happen. Uh, now, we couldn't put our Navy SEALs on a ketogenic diet because a ketogenic diet is a stressful diet overall. While you are on a military mission, we ask you not to eat carbohydrates, not to eat your bread or pasta or sugar in general or you know desserts. It would be pretty, pretty severe. So, in order to avoid the stress, we decided we would have um, synthesized in our lab a non uh, precursor, a, a, a ionic non um, uh, precursor of uh, ketone bodies that was able to mimic uh, the ketogenic diet action, but without being on a ketogenic diet. This is pretty much with a ketone ester. A ketone ester was able to speed up uh, the um, amount of uh, ketones in our blood in the animal's blood specifically, uh, without following ketogenic diet. So our hypothesis was maybe ketone esters can show any anticonvulsant effects against the seizures. But let's, let, let's move a, a step backward. What is a ketogenic diet? Ketogenic diet is, even if it might, you know, it might uh, look a, a little hard to sustain, uh, uh, is definitely um, an, 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 an optimal diet. This diet, sorry about that. Uh, this diet um, is made mainly of uh, fat, about 75% fat, 5% carbohydrates, and 20% proteins, like in a normal diet. Uh, what, type, what type of food can we eat during a ketogenic diet? We can eat fish, meat, um, you know, 
uh, dried fruits such as uh, walnuts, almonds, chestnuts, and so forth. Olive oil, butter, but also bacon, eggs, and so forth. What does happen when you are on a ketogenic diet? Pretty much your glucose reserves go down, your glucose, blood glucose goes down, as well as insulin. Uh, what is the optimal level of ketosis? So far, it's been identified in between two and five millimolars. Although we start being in ketosis as we hit, you know, the value of 0 0.5, 0 0.7 millimolar. Of course, after a value of eight millimolar, we should start, you know, worrying about the fact that we are going over, uh, over way too much into ketosis and we are touching the ketoacidosis. Although this, is, this shouldn't happen if we are functioning uh, liver and kidneys. Uh, so what is the keto adaptation? Of course, our body is not used to that kind of uh, metabolism. But once we get used to uh, ketosis, to ketones, to blood ke to you know, to... Um, by a ketone body, sorry, uh, we start having a decreased central fatigue and enhanced brain metabolism, but also an increase in reactive oxygen species, uh, a, a decrease in reactive oxygen species production, uh, but also an increase in uh, biogenesis of mitochondria uh, and also an increase in insulin sensitivity. Also less lactate in muscles. Bolick and colleagues have been uh, reporting this since uh, 2010, so it's been quite a while. It's not a recent thing. In fact, as I was mentioning earlier, uh, it's been over 100 years now that the ketogenic diet has been discovered, quote unquote. 1922 is the, is the year that the first article uh, on the Los Angeles Times came up, speaking of this um, specific uh, approach. In fact, the John Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore used to apply this uh, method on um, children affected by epilepsy, grand mal uh, epilepsy. Uh, they found that about one third of patients were completely out of uh, seizures. Uh, another third was um, highly affected. They might reduce the, you know, they might have reduced their uh, medication dosages, but in the end that worked pretty well. And in the last third of patients that didn't work at all. So I have a good statistics about that. But this was not even the very first report talking about uh, ketosis and the EF beneficial effects of ketosis. Back in 400 before Christ, the Hippocrates discussed about um, basically starvation. He mentioned about some people uh, being uh, possessed by the devil. And these people were put in isolation with no food, just water for a few days. Well, after a few days, they came up, uh, they came out of their uh, uh, isolation with no issues anymore. So most likely these patients, these possessed patients, these possessed people were uh, uh, individuals affected by epilepsy. But back in the days, there was no diagnosis of epilepsy itself. So if you wanna have a, an idea of what I'm talking about, if you're curious about the metabolism of ketones, Go read this uh, very comprehensive review from George Cahill. So uh, there is a seizure protection um, mainly, uh, thanks to the ketone bodies, and we needed to find a way to prevent seizures to happen. So we gavaged our rats with a ketone ester to mimic the action of a ketogenic diet without putting our rats in the ketogenic diet. And we found that uh, uh, there was an increase in resistance against these uh, uh, seizures in our animals, um, about 600%. So if a rat would seize in 10 minutes normally, after this uh, ketone ester gavage intragastric, intragastrically, these rats would resist not 10 minutes, but 60 minutes, one hour, which is impressive. So we communicated this finding to the Navy, and we're very happy about it. And we also found that the, uh, among the three ketone bodies, which are beta hydroxybutyrate acet, acetin, um, acet, acetate and acetin, this ladder, the acetin, is the most responsible for the anti-epileptic, anti-convulsant activity. So I moved back to Italy uh, in mid-2013, and I started working with uh, Dr. Vijan and Dr. Coppola. These uh, two individuals are um, one of the two uh, highest um, you know, uh, eminences to work with ketogenic diet in the country of Italy. And we've been uh, applying the ketone ester that we have patented in the United States with a new method, a new model of uh, 
uh, of seizures, a seizure study, the pentylenethrazole. Now, with the pentylenethrazole, we found that there was a consistent increase in the resistance against seizures if the animals were gavaged earlier, like 30 minutes earlier. Then the experiment, read them if you're interested. Uh, in 2014 and sorry, in 2015 and 2016. Uh, but let's discuss about the neuroprotective effect of ketones. It's not just uh, you know um, against epilepsy. We also have a, a very uh, wide use against uh, weight loss, but also in Alzheimer's disease, in Parkinson's disease, and Lou Gehrig's disease, and other the neurodegenerative neurodegenerative pathologies. Not to mention the traumatic brain injury and some forms of cancer especially those related to the brain. So brain cancer, such as glioblastoma, which is one, one of the most aggressive forms of brain cancers. Uh, we know that because in normal conditions, cells will uh, look for sugar, for, uh, um, uh, for glucose. Uh, but when we do not introduce this glucose anymore, only the uh, endogenous glucose from the gluconeogenesis would be produced. And that would not be enough. So if we move, in healthy cells, the main uh, energy source would be sugar. When sugar is over, uh, cells, we start looking for energy in a different way. So that would be ketone bodies, energy coming from the fat. Uh, in uh, uh, cancer cells, uh, there is no uh, mitochondrial uh, adaptation. So there is no way to metabolize ketone bodies, especially in cancers, in brain cancers. So if we take off carbohydrates out of our diet, we pretty much um, isolate uh, these cancer cells. Uh, and we cells selectively would give nutrition just to, uh, health, to healthy cells. Then I am, so I, when I moved to Italy, I needed some sort of partners that would help me uh, keeping the Italians away from their sugar. So we needed a company that would produce uh, pasta, pizza, bread, Nutella, and other, uh, you know, other carb-based food uh, with the sensation of allowing them to have that taste. And uh, I found this, this people, uh, Legambe di Ketogenic Foods, have been discussing about uh, international projects and been discussing about uh, new projects coming on the market and so forth. But then I've been uh, releasing a, a number of videos on YouTube explaining uh, why ketosis might be good for you. Might be good for a ketogenic diet for losing weight for some sort of pathologies, some new neurodegenerative pathologies, but also uh, good for um, traumatic brain injury and as well as GLUT1 deficiency, which is highly related to the um, uh, impossibility of metabolizing glucose. So, I've been publishing a number of uh, uh, review articles over the years, explaining uh, pretty much what the uh, ketosis and the ketogenic diet might be good for. Um, then with this company, I've been uh, um, getting through uh, some bureaucracy and we've been uh, uh, having, we obtained the Ministry of Health uh, agreement to distribute this food to um, these patients, to those um, patients' families uh, that couldn't afford it. Um, then I've been uh, discussing and uh, dealing with a number of patients for the, I mean, through the ketogenic diet. And specifically, I had some cancer uh, patients that have been uh, wanting to follow the ketogenic diet in a quite strict manner. The, I'm just going to briefly mention them. Uh, so this guy mm, had a, um, a prostate cancer. He was put on a mild ketogenic diet. And after two months on the ketogenic diet, his uh, PSA, the prostate-specific antigen, went from 1.62 to 1, which is a great result. Uh, he's been over two years on a ketogenic diet, and his PSA is below 1. And there is no evidence of cancer recurrence and so forth. The other patients had pancreatic cancer. I was put on a strict ketogenic diet and his uh, cancer antigen went from 43.69 to 9.84 unit per milliliter, which is a huge, um, a huge improvement. Uh, after two and a half years on a ketogenic diet, there is no evidence of cancer recurrence in his PET scan. Uh, then we have um, glial lesions. Uh, in this case, we had um, a four to one, so a very strict ketogenic diet. 
after nine months in a ketogenic diet, it was a reduction of lesions of tumor mass and of the edema. Now we have Marco, uh, stage four uh, colonodinocarcinoma. Uh, he was put on a strict ketogenic diet and he was, uh, mm, you know, uh, he's been uh, uh, having a, a quite a good life for a long time. Um, he's been keeping his cancer under control. But we also have a, a glycogenosis case. Uh, it was put on a mild ketogenic diet, and after a while, it was able to uh, go back to work and exercise with no more spasm or pain. And finally, we have glioblastoma multiforme, which is one of the most aggressive uh, brain cancers. Uh, it was put on a four to one ketogenic diet, um, so it's quite straight, uh, strict ketogenic diet. And uh, uh, after one year, he had. Um, uh, you know, no evidence of tumor mass. Every year, uh, Professor Taliabu and myself have been organizing a number of events in Italy, uh, you know, uh, for inviting registered dietitians to uh, learn uh, how to use a ketogenic diet for therapy. Uh, just the uh, COVID, the, you know, the pandemic has been uh, uh, preventing us to do that because we couldn't organize wherever we wanted. Um, and just let's discuss about the very last point of this presentation, which is the ketogenic diet associated with uh, um, Parkinson's disease. Now, you're not going to find very much in literature because there is a risk in Parkinson patients related to constipation. And ketogenic diet has two main side effects. One is constipation. The other one is osteoporosis that, you know, they're both um, reversible. But, um, uh, you know, when a pathology such as uh, a Parkinson disease, um, you know, might present some problems if you're constipated, then no neurologist, no physician, no specialist want to, uh, you know, uh, give it a try and take the risk. So um, we found in literature that the very few papers have discovered and uh, reported that uh, um, there is a neurotoxin, the MPTP, that is responsible for the neurodegeneration. And then the beta-hydroxybutyrate uh, is able to uh, contrast its activity. Um, and we found this on a number of different papers, as we can see here. Uh, so we uh, wanted to translate this research onto patients. So we started uh, working on some Parkinson patients in this building which is a, um, a private clinics in Italy, in Southern Italy. And uh, specifically, well, this is uh, the team. Um, we've been working on uh, uh, their, uh, you know, the analysis of the speaking abilities, facial expressions, tremble at rest, rigidity, hand mobility, capability of standing up and so forth. Uh, we wanted to collect data for three months before, during, and after a ketogenic diet. But of course, pandemics didn't allow this to finish our study. We only went through one month. We wanted to analyze autonomic dysfunction, sleep troubles, neuropsychiatric disturbances, and other problems. And we used the G-walk test, the time up and go test, and the 10 meter walking test. <clears throat> um, we also analyzed their uh, frontal functions, such as the phonemic fluency and semantic fluency. And this is uh, what a typical experiment would look like. <clears throat> you have to remember pattern and the path that the physician had decided for them. Uh, they have to choose to pick uh, among different possibilities. And we wanted to understand if uh, the if ketosis would be able to prevent their new degeneration and actually help them you know, be more uh, responsive. Um, we haven't been finishing our study because of COVID-19, uh, but we have a, a, a little pool of data that uh, gave us important information. Um, especially, we've been reading through this paper uh, published in 2018 from a group in New Zealand, uh, led by Dr. Phillips. Uh, Dr. Phillips <clears throat> demonstrated on a pool of 37 initially and then 38 patients. <clears throat> <clears throat> Sorry about that. Then there was a decrease in urinary problems after the ketogenic diet, two months on a ketogenic diet. So urinary problems were decreased, as well as pain, fatigue, daytime sleepiness, and cognitive impairment. Well, we found a very similar, um, very similar uh, data regarding the urinary problems. In fact, our patients didn't have any uh, urinary problems at all. 
Uh, but also what uh, Dr. Phillips demonstrated with this group is that the ketogenic diet is safe to be followed for a, a long period of time. Um, and this is um, this is a type of uh, uh, you know uh, gatherings and events that we used to organize uh, every year before COVID nineteen. We used to uh, allow uh, Parkinson's patients to get together and to learn more about the um, possibilities uh, that we were studying about. You have now, five our, minutes. Yes. Five minutes. Five minutes. Thank you. Um, that'd be, uh, you know, the, uh, our next step would be uh, to apply our ketone ester onto this type of patients without forcing them to be on a ketogenic diet. I quickly want to thank uh, the GLUT1 Deficiency Association, uh, rareconnect.org, which is a great uh, website that allows people with rare disease to get connected with their families, of course. I have to thank you, Dr. Cosimina Cusano, who has been helping me treating with a number of uh, patients uh, affected by uh, you know, different pathologies through the ketogenic diet. And the very last point of this presentation is that I want to introduce uh, a few movies, like four movies that might, might be of great interest if you like the topic. One is Fed Up, uh, which is a movie that came up in 2014, if I'm not mistaken, in the United States and explains how bad sugar can be for us. Uh, this is an Australian movie called That Sugar Film, uh, which, um, in which the main character undergoes a number of extreme exposures to, sh to, to sugar, and uh, he shows how bad this can be for uh, our health. This other movie uh, came out in September 2017 in the United States. It's entitled The Magic Pill. I encourage you to go, uh, to go watch it if you, if you like this topic. And last but not least, Butter Makes My Pants Fall Off, which is a homemade movie. And in this movie, this guy, who used to be much bigger than uh, what he really is, uh, describes how he lost his so much weight just by eating um, a high, uh, you know, a high fat uh, um, type of diet, uh, especially butter, olive oil, and so forth. And also his blood parameters went back to normal. I want to thank my European colleagues, my American colleagues, my other colleagues everywhere in the world. Thank you so much for uh, uh, your attention. If you have any questions, I'd be very happy to answer. Thank you. Okay.